Yeah, it's funny. I mean, you 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 talk about that the current sort of decentralized world, DeFi, but decentralized services world is primarily just tokens, and it's basically just financial transactions. And the kind of thing, the reason why it's super exciting, the kind of thing you're doing with Chainlink and Oracle Networks, is that you can basically open up the whole world of services to into this kind of um, decentralized smart contract world. I mean, you're talking about just orders of magnitude greater impact financially and just socially and philosophically. Are there interesting near-term and long-term applications that excite you? Yeah, there's there's a lot that excites me. And, and that is how I think about it, that it's not just about we made a decentralized Oracle network. It's about we made a decentralized service or collection of services mm -hmm. that's going from hundreds to thousands. And then people are able to build the hybrid smart contracts, which I think will redefine what our industry is about. Because, for example, for the people that only learned about blockchains through the lens of NFTs, they understand blockchains through NFTs, not through speculative tokens or Bitcoins, mm -hmm. right? And I think that 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 will continue. I, I think the use cases that excite me, they vary between the developed uh, market, uh, the developed world's economies and emerging markets. I think that in the developed world, what you will see is that transparency, creating a level, a new level of information for how markets work and the risk that is in markets and kind of the dynamics that put the global financial system at systemic financial risk, like mm -hmm. 2008. And my hope is that all of this infrastructure will, will soften the boom and bust cycles by making information immediately available to all market participants, which is, by the way, what all market participants want, mm -hmm. except for the very, very, very small minority that are able to game the system in their benefit and benefit from booms but avoid busts because of their asymmetric access to, to information, which really everybody should have and which this technically solves. Mm -hmm. I think in the process of doing that, and which is happening, I think, right about now, you see a polishing of the technology such that it can be made available to emerging markets. Mm -hmm. And on a personal level, I feel that um, the emerging markets will benefit much more from this technology, just like the emerging markets benefit much more from the internet mm -hmm. or from those you know, $50 Android phones that people can have, because it's, it's such a massive shift in how people's lives work, right? Mm -hmm. I have always had access to books and a library, which has been fantastic and, and very important. But there are places in the world where people don't have libraries, but they, now they have the internet and a $50 Android phone, and they can watch the same Stanford lecture that I watch. I mean, that's kind of mind-blowing, re realistically, right? They, they, they just went from zero to one in a very, very dramatic way. Mm -hmm. I think all of these smart contracts, and in, in my case, I think the one that I seem to keep coming back to is crop insurance, where partly because it doesn't have a tokenization component, partly because it's actually much more important than, 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 than it might seem, um, what is crop insurance? Right. So, so, so <laughs> exactly. So, so this this is this is the nature of why it's sometimes hard to see the full value of what our industry does because it solves all these kinds of back end problems that we don't have. Right. Mm -hmm. So, crop insurance is if I own a farm and it doesn't rain, I get an insurance payout, so I don't need to close down my farm mm -hmm. because if it didn't rain, I don't have crops. Right. So, people in the developed world can get crop insurance, and there's all kinds of systems that basically pay them out, and then they can argue with the legal, uh, with the insurance company if they don't get paid out properly and whatever. And this allows people to smooth out risk. Mm -hmm. in, in fact, a lot of the global options markets were, were about this, right? They were initially about people selling their produce or their crops ahead of time so that if there was a risk of drought, they weren't impacted by it, mm -hmm. right? And that's where a lot of options trading and all this kind of stuff came from even though it's now turned into this kind of global casino. But in the emerging market, there are there are literally people that if they don't have rain for two seasons, they need to close down their farm and become a migrant worker of some kind. Mm -hmm. And now they have a $50 Android phone where they can read Wikipedia, but they're still decades away from an insurance company coming to their geography and offering them insurance because their local legal system simply doesn't allow that type of thing to exist. No insurance company is going to go and create an insurance entity and offer them insurance because, you know, the levels of fraud and the ability to resolve that fraud through courts would just not exist. So now these people have to wait for decades to have this very basic form of financial protection or, or something like a bank account even. 
And with this technology, they don't, right? So mm -hmm. with this technology, if I have a $50 Android phone and the smart contract has data from satellites or weather stations about the weather conditions in the geography that my farm is in, I can, I can put value into the smart contract and the smart contract will automatically pay me out back, pay me back out at my Android phone. And, and guess what? I just leapfrogged past my corrupt government not being able to, to provide um, a legal infrastructure to create insurance. I just leapfrogged past dealing with insurance companies that will probably price gouge me and, 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 and often not pay out. And I leapfrogged into the world of hyper-reliable, um, kind of guaranteed smart contract outcomes that are as good or in many cases better than what farmers in all parts of other parts of the world have. And this type of dynamic for the emerging markets of creating a way for people to control and manage risk in their economic life, I think extends way past insurance. It extends to them having bank accounts to combat local inflation. It extends to them being able to sell their goods on the global free market of global trade without middlemen. It, ex it extends to all these things that we don't really care about, right? Because we're not farmers, mm -hmm. but are unbelievably impactful for people that don't have a bank account and their infl inflation rate in their country is double digits mm -hmm. or their farm completely depends on rain or their livelihood completely depends on their ability to sell goods and they can't sell those goods because there's a middleman who essentially controls all the trust relationships but now now we have the internet and smart contracts and that might not have to be the case in, in, in the next five or 10 years. Yeah, so that definitely has a, a quality of life impact on the particular farmer's life, but I suspect it has a huge, like down the line ripple effect on the whole supply chain. So if, if you think about farmers, but any other people that produce things that are part of a large uh, like logistics network, like a supply chain network, mm -hmm. that means when you increase reliability, you sort of increase uh, transparency and control, but like where any one node in that supply chain network can um, formalize the way it operates in, in its agreements with others, then you could just have a very like at scale transformative effect on how people that down the line use the services that you provide, the products that you create, operate. So like, it's almost hard to um, imagine the the possible ways it might transform the world. I, I wonder how much friction there is in the system, I guess, currently that uh, smart contracts might remove. That's, a, that's, a, that's almost unknown. You can sort of hypothesize and stuff, but I wonder. I've seen enough bureaucracy in my world, in my life to know that smart contracts in many cases would remove bureaucracy. And I wonder how the world will be once you remove much of the bureaucracy. Coming from the Soviet Union, where I just have seen the life sucked out of the innovative spirit of human nature by bureaucracy, I wonder, you know, the kind of amazing world that could be created once bureaucracy is removed. Yeah, I, I, I think it's, I think it's fascinating how the world can can evolve. I, I think this extends a lot further than people think into many, many different parts of the global economy. It might start with NFTs for art, or it might start with DeFi, right? Or it might start with fraud-proof ad networks. Next, we we don't know what it's going to go to next, but I think the implication of people being in a system of contracts that holds them accountable and guarantees contractual outcomes, regardless of a local legal system, is something that I think extends, you know, to the supply chain. You can prove that goods were sourced in an in an ethical way, and you can prove that in a way that can't be gamed. That'll change buying power and supplier power and and how people produce goods that we all consume. And then on the political level. I personally think that in a number of decades, we could literally be in a place where politicians can commit to a certain set of smart contract um, kind of budget definitional kind of results. For example, you know, we discovered oil. I promise as a politician, I'm going to take the oil and I'm going to redistribute it to all of you. Well, that's wonderful. That's a great idea. Sounds very nice when, you, when you're running for office. Why don't we codify that in a smart contract? 
And why don't we put those conditions very solidly on a blockchain? And then once once you've you, you've been elected, we'll just turn that one on, and it'll 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 distribute the money just like you said, and everything will be fine. I I personally think that this new level of systems that allows trustworthy collaboration between everybody, between supply chain partners, ad network users, the financial system, insurance companies, and farmers, all of these are just interactions that require a trusted um, entity, or in this case, a trusted piece of code to orchestrate the interaction in the way that everyone agrees. And yep. Yeah, one of the things that makes the United States fascinating is the founding documents. And it's fascinating to think of us moving into the new in the 21st century to a, a digital version of that. So the constitution, a smart constitution, no offense to the uh, paper constitution, but and that would change. That would have transformative effects on politicians and governments, holding people accountable. Oh man, I, that's so that's so exciting to think that um, we might enforce uh, accountability through the smart contract process. Exactly. Why can't that happen? Any anything that we could codify into a smart contract. And anything that we all agree is the way the world should work. And then anything that we can get proof about, right? Anything that a system somewhere could tell us happened, those are the pieces of the puzzle, right? We need a trusted piece of code. We need to have agreement that that's how the world should work. And we need a system that'll tell that trusted piece of code what happened. Mm -hmm. As, As long as we have those three things, we can theoretically codify any set of agreements about uh, about about anything where those three properties uh, take hold. I wonder if you can apply that to like military conflict and so on. Uh, recently, uh, the Biden announced that we're going to pull off from Afghanistan after 20, 20 years in the war. I wonder, there's a lot of debacle, uh, debacles around war in Afghanistan and invasion of Iraq, all those kinds of things. I wonder if that was, instead formulated as a smart contract. <laughs> like uh, that might have actually huge impact on the way we do conflict. So you, you think of a uh, smart contract as a as a kind of win-win situation where you're doing like financial transactions or something like that. But you could see that also about military conflict or like whenever two nations are at tension with each other, different scales of conflict that you can have conflict codified. And that would potentially resolve conflict much faster because there's honesty, transparency, and control within that conflict because there's conflict in this world. And I, I, again, very, very inspiring to think about the the kind of effects it might have on the, on, on the negative kinds of contracts, on the tense, painful kinds of contracts. I haven't thought about that as much as actually kind of scary the stuff you're you're thinking through now with like the war contracts or something. <laughs> you know, that's not in the white paper. We don't have anything yeah. about war contracts or anything. Again, this is the the but, Russian. Uh, we're we're both Russian, but I'm a little more Russian uh, in the suffering side. Maybe I read way too much Dostoevsky and uh, military kind of ideas. But anyway, holding politicians accountable in all forms, I think, is really powerful.